Hello everyone, in this video we delve into the multifaceted legacy of Jawaharlal Nehru in the context of India's nation building journey. We will explore both the constructive contributions and the blunders done by him. Nehru, after he became a barrister in England, rolls back to India in 1912 and then he started to practice as an advocate at Allahabad High Court. But guess what? The legal scene wasn't really his jam. His heart's calling was the freedom of his country. So he dives into politics. Fast forward to 1916. He bumps into the big man himself, Mahatma Gandhi, at a congress meet in Lucknow. But wait, Gandhi's autobiography from the 1920s, Nehru doesn't even get a cameo. Understandable, though back then Nehru was like the supporting actor. Jumping to 1929, the Provincial Congress Committees had voted in the order of Gandhi, Patel and Nehru for the presidency of the Lahore Congress. Gandhi declined the honor and according to the rule, the next choice Patel became the successful candidate. But Jawaharlal Nehru's father, Motilal Nehru, who died in 1931, wanted to see his son attain that national honor before his death. He pleaded Gandhi to persuade Patel to withdraw. The Gandhi intervened and Patel agreed and that's how Nehru became president of Lower Congress. During freedom movements, Nehru was imprisoned nine times. Nine imprisonments later, Nehru is practically a freedom fighter veteran. Post-1945, Nehru was playing legal superhero, defending the Indian National Army charged with disloyalty. In 1946, provincial committees want Patel, not Nehru, as president. But Gandhi does his thing, makes Patel step back, because he thought Nehru was the man with the British connections. Nehru battles the Muslim League on India's division, but in 1947, he reluctantly agrees with Mountbatten's plan. It's a tough call for him. It's 1947 and Nehru was drawing up the list of India's first cabinet, but hold on a sack, they're set waste. Patel, the man himself, is missing from the list. Now who steps in? The Mountbatten, the viceroy of all people. Guess what? He nudges Nehru. Thanks to a little whisper from VP Menon and Patel makes it into the cabinet. Nehru was keen on Rajgopalachari as president, but Patel and Congress backed Prasad. It's a political tug of war. When Nehru asked Prasad to withdraw his name from the contest, Prasad is reported to have said that if Patel and Nehru agreed on Rajgopalachari's name, he would withdraw. This was of course not possible and Prasad was selected as the president of India. Now the Nehru in era kicks off. One party rules and the Nehru is the uncrowned king. But here's the twist. He was a democrat taking everyone along. Some call it indecisiveness. But the man was just democratic to the core. Alright, let's dive into the twists and turns of the Kashmir issue. So when India was stitching together those princely states, Vallabhai Patel was the master. But when it came to Kashmir, Nehru took the lead. Now there's a bit of drama here. Patel and Nehru, they are like chalk and cheese. In October 1947, Patel's eyebrows were furrowed because Nehru won't greenlight the Maharaja of Kashmir's move to join India unless Sheikh Abdullah gets the throne. As it looks like the Kashmir mess, blame it on two things. First, Nehru was not exactly close with Maharaja Hari Singh. Second, Hari Singh and Sheikh Abdullah, they are not exactly exchanging friendship. Now, here's where it gets spicy. Nehru was tight with Sheikh Abdullah while Patel and Hari Singh are basically close. It's criticism time. Nehru's decision to hit pause on Indian troops advance gets the spotlight. Patel was not a fan of this idea. He was saying, let the army do its thing. Kick those invaders out, but wait for it. Mountbatten steps in saying, hold your horses, no war with Pakistan. Nehru against Patel's advice, it's the break. What was the result? Part of Kashmir, also known as Azad Kashmir, becomes Pakistan's permanent playground. And raise yourself, it eventually becomes China's favorite spot. Another red scratcher, Nehru's idea to take the Kashmir drama to the UN. Patel was shaking his head, but Mountbatten's got ideas. And guess what? Nehru rolls with it. Now talk about a plot twist. Gopalaswamy Iyengar gets the UN odd seat. And Nehru was personally overseeing the show in parliament. It's like a political thriller, intrigue, betrayal and a touch of international drama. So there you have it, the Kashmir saga, a roller caster ride of decisions, friendship. <laughs> Nehru and Mountbatten, the duo that turned the princely issue into a global puzzle. Alright, let's unravel the complexities of Article 370 and the Kashmir saga. As I said earlier, India was stitching together the states, but Kashmir was throwing a twist. Nehru was thinking, let's treat it like others. But Sheikh Abdullah, the big 
player in Kashmir is saying, hold on, not so fast. The Sheikh was most anxious that the accession of the state should continue in respect of the three subjects of defence, foreign affairs and communications only. Now, Article 370 enters the scene. Supposed to be a temporary, but guess what? It sticks around until 2019. Nehru's close friend Sheikh Abdullah is in the spotlight for kinda letting India down in this matter. Patel always had his suspicions about Abdullah. Even back in 1948, Sheikh was talking to Americans about Kashmir's independence. Sneaky right? The twist is Nehru was still team Abdullah, even after the Article 370 mess. Patel was probably shaking his head somewhere. Now here's where it gets wild. Nehru could have untangled this mess early on, but he hesitated. His approach was sentimental and lacking foresight. Patel could have been the fixer, but Nehru hesitated again. Picture this, Nehru hands over the reins to Mountbatten and things get complicated. United Nations organization, ceasefire and Nehru's optimism. It's like watching a suspense movie. Fast forward and Nehru's new found trust in the UNO backfires. Or trading on blocks, not merit, decide things. Nehru under the British fails to protect India's interests. Another shocker, Britain playing the great game, pushing for the partition of Jammu and Kashmir. Even Nehru and Patel seemed on board. The Kashmir question turns into a British puppet show. Sheikh Abdullah once a political gain gets detained. Nehru's policy drift and the legacy continues. Nehru was catching some heat for suggesting a referendum in Kashmir. But hold up, there's a back story. Remember Junagat, where the majority were Hindus but the ruler wanted to join Pakistan? People got upset, the ruler ran off to Pakistan. So India organized a vote and bam, Junagat joined the Indian squad. Nehru was pretty sure a similar referendum in Kashmir would swing in India's favor, especially with Sheikh Abdullah on our side. Now let's talk about Shyam Prasad Mukherjee. He was in the spotlight because he ended up dead under mysterious circumstances in Srinagar. Why? Well, Sheikh Abdullah had him under house arrest. But why? Because Mukherjee went to Jammu and Kashmir challenging this crazy permit system with his slogan One nation, one tricolor, one law and no to special permits, no to flags, no to constitutions for Jammu and Kashmir. But here's the twist. Nehru said no to an investigation into Mukherjee's death. Why? Maybe it's a piece of the bigger puzzle we are missing without any solid evidence. So there you have it, Nehru's Kashmir Saga. A mix of political chess, questionable decisions and a touch of suspense. What a ride through the pages of history. Alright, now we are diving into Nehru's roller coaster ride with China. A tale of warnings ignored, misplaced trust and a diplomatic chess match gone wrong. So picture this, back in the 1950s, Patel, the wise guy, sends Nehru a couple of letters waving red flags about China's expansionist dreams. But did Nehru pay attention? No. Fast forward to 1962, when China and India decide to play military tug of war, turns out Patel's warnings were likely crystal balls into the future. Imagine if they had just had that cabinet meeting Patel suggested, could have changed the game. Now Nehru was thinking, let's be buddies with China and everything will be peachy. But surprise, China's not playing nice. They claim a chunk of Indian territory and say the boundary is just a suggestion. Wait, it gets wilder. Nehru was so invested in this friendship that he still roots for China at the UN, even after the 1962 beatdown. Meanwhile, back in 1950, when Tibet was crying for help against China, India tries to be the superhero. But guess what Nehru does? Silences it saying China is behaving properly, no need for UN intervention. Classic narrow right? Time for some failed negotiation. India was bending backwards, suggesting compromises, but China was like, nah, we will invade instead. And boom, the Sino-Indian border problem is born. Hold on, we are not done. Pakistan and China strike a deal behind India's back, swapping Kashmir's land and years the kicker. China was cool with it, even though they recognized Kashmir as a part of India in 1956. Sneaky moves. Now Nehru got this rosy view of China, thinking they are just misunderstood. But turns out he was not checking the map. China was literally climbing parts of India on those ancient maps. And Nehru was like, no biggie. Now things take a bizarre turn. Nehru grants asylum to Dalai Lama, taking of China. But the real drama was Nehru's rejection of Pakistan President Ayub's offer to team up against China. Flash forward to 1962, wars on the horizon and Nehru was caught off guard. Intel warnings ignored and the army ill-prepared. And the rest is history. The Henderson Brooks report, a classified mystery, holds all the secrets. And the forward policy in 1961, just another mistake. 
army posts without support unrealistic plans nehru was getting flack and rightly so as the china crisis hits nehru's credibility takes a hit too no confidence motions criticism in parliament it's a rough ride even the supercilious attitude towards the americans couldn't save the day and here's the kicker Nehru's dream of a non-aligned India takes a blow. The fallout from the China debacle stains his legacy and the myth of 1962 stays guarded behind the classified doors. So there you have it folks, Nehru's China Chronicles, a saga of misplaced trust, unchecked optimism and geopolitical misstep. What a wild ride through the twists and turns of Nehru in diplomacy. All right everyone, we are stepping into the political maze of the misuse of Article 356. A tool meant for dire situations but in Nehru's time seemed to be wielded like a political weapon. Picture this, it's the 1950s and the Congress is flexing its political muscle. The first use of President's rule wasn't some grand constitutional crisis. No, it was an internal Congress stiff in Punjab. Hold on, it gets interesting. The governor reports to President Rajendra Prasad that the constitutional machinery in Punjab has collapsed. Spoiler alert, it's more of an official drama than a real breakdown. But here's the twist. Nehru leading the charge decides Chief Minister Gopi Chand Bhargava should pack his bags despite having a legislative majority. Why? Nehru claims it's a law and order mess. But Prasad isn't buying it. Fast forward, Nehru uses Article 356 six times, not because of some national emergency, but to flex Congress muscles. He was turning the president's rule into a political chess piece, making sure the Congress reigns supreme in the center state arena. Now here is the kicker. No non-Congress chief minister could finish their full term during Nehru's reign. Talk about power moves. Nehru wasn't just setting precedents. He was turning Article 356 into his political plaything. So in this political theater, Nehru wasn't just the lead actor. He was directing the show. The constitution and federalism took a hit as the Congress party danced on the line between party interests and national needs. Nehru's moves weren't just questionable. They were a bad example. The office of the governor got tangled up in Congress party politics and limited federalism took a hit. It wasn't the last time, but it sure set the stage for a trend of political maneuvering at the cost of representative democracy. And there you have it, people, the Nehru era's misuse of Article 356, where political drama met constitutional twist, leaving a legacy that shaped the power dynamics for years to come. Politics, ah, never a dull moment. All right, everyone. Now we are diving into the wild world of the First Amendment and the creation of the Ninth Schedule. Now you might think, what's the fuss about a bill? Well, let me tell you, this one was no ordinary bill. It was a real head scratcher. So picture this. There's this bill, right? And on the surface, there is hardly any reason to object to it. No sentimental strings attached. But it turned out to be a real monster. Now, why was it cooked up in the first place? Brace your sir. This bill was like a shield, a superhero cape for the Zamindari abolition legislation. It aimed to make it immune from challenges, especially those pesky ones about not getting enough compensation. Yes, the kicker. The amendment wrapped up 13th Tenancy and Zamindari Abolition Act in this protective bubble. Sounds good, right? But spoiler alert, the remedy proved to be worse than the disease. Imagine trying to fix one problem, but oops, you end up creating a bigger mess. That's exactly what happened here. The bill meant to protect ended up stirring the pot. It's like trying to cure a headache with a sledgehammer. Now you might be wondering why the drama... Well, it all boils down to the consequences. The production this bill offered was like a double-edged sword. Sure, it shielded the legislation, but it also raised eyebrows and fueled debates. So there you have it, people. The First Amendment and the Ninth Schedule. A roller coaster ride of good intentions gone a bit heavier. Sometimes in the world of bills and amendments, things are not always what they seem. It's a tangled web of legal twists and turns, and this one sure left its mark in the history book. Let's dive into the complex world of Nehru's turns on corruption, a realm where the nuances of integrity and political pressure often collided. Nehru, a man of personal honesty, was some say a bit too soft when it came to dealing with those tainted by corruption. Now let's unfold the Chagla Commission of Enquiry, a chapter where public pressure played a pivotal role. The stage was set with allegations involving the LIC and share purchases in British India Corporation Limited. Now enters Feroz Gandhi. who in parliament raised concerns about LIC buying shares at inflated prices without even consulting the LIC's investment board. 
but yes the twist nehru if given the choice might not have opted for such an inquiry the chagla commission of inquiry was set in motion and credit where it's due nehru ensured the report hit the lok sabha table just 3 days after its receipt in a world where commission reports often gather does nehru swiftly move for a debate from 19 to 21st february 1958 it's a tale of navigating integrity public perception and political pressures showing that even leaders with the best intentions sometimes face the challenge of balancing the scales in a complex political landscape. Now let's step back into the pages of history. A time when a visionary leader named Nehru orchestrated the blueprint for one of India's most prestigious that were the Indian Institutes of Technology or as we fondly call them the IITs. Picture this, in 1950, just three years after independence, the first IIT emerged from the grounds of the Ijali detention camp. near Karakpur in West Bengal it wasn't just a stand alone institution it was a symbol of india's commitment to technological excellence but nehru didn't stop there to maintain balance across regions four more iits sprouted by 1961 in bombay madras kanpur and delhi nehru amid cold war tensions managed to secure support from global giants like the soviet union the united states germany and great britain it's like he orchestrated a global symphony for the progress of these institutions now let's shift our gaze to the colossal bakra dam a marvel stretched across the satlej river in bilsapur himachal pradesh this mammoth structure wasn't just about preventing floods it was a lifeline carrying water and electricity to the fertile lands of Punjab. It's undeniable Nehru's consistent and spontaneous political backing was the driving force behind this scientific and industrial endeavors. Imagine the pettiness of denying this fact. Nehru laid the foundation for these projects during the crucial formative phase of our nation, a testament to his foresight and dedication. Let's dive into the dynamic era of Nehru, a time when the heartbeat of India echoed with his unwavering faith in democracy. But told out it wasn't just about the big stage nehru envisioned democracy thriving right at the grassroots panchayati raj devolution of power this weren't just policies they were nehru's dream for a vibrant inclusive democracy at every level now let's talk parliamentary system nehru was all about it adult franchise became the cornerstone of his governance policy giving every citizen a voice in the nation's journey but despite his efforts for social justice there were hiccups talk about land reforms while well, they didn't spread evenly leading to some significant inequalities here comes a proud moment nehru championed the reform of the ancient hindu civil code it wasn't just about legalities it was about empowering hindu widows with equality in inheritance and property matters But let's face it even the great save their misstep Nehru's dismissal of the elected communist government in Kerala that's a blemish on his democratic record now picture this the reconstruction of the Somnath temple Dr Rajendra Prasad was all set to attend but Nehru saw it as a communal act it's a clash of ideologies in the temple shadow let's dive into Nehru's legacy of communal harmony a tale of passion for minorities and a commitment to secularism that echoed through the corridors of independent india picture this nehru fought tooth and nail in the constituent assembly striving for special safeguards in the constitution and he didn't just stop at words he was vigilant ensuring those safeguards were more than ink on paper but hey it didn't stop there nehru was the architect of the ministry of minorities a visionary move to address the concerns of religious minority groups now here's where nehru stands out his commitment to secularism runs deep unrivaled in the national movement becoming the first prime minister of independent india he set the nation on a secular path but wait the journey wasn't all smooth post partition when riots shook delhi and attacks targeted muslims nehru didn't sit in his office he rushed to the front lines a bold move to stop the rioters and ensure the safety of muslim now imagine this nehru the beacon of secularism facing disapproval from stalwarts like patel rajendra prasad and fellow congress leaders it was a clash of ideologies in the face of rising tension in a nutshell nehru's quest for communal harmony was an just political rhetoric it was a hands on commitment the ministry of minorities wasn't just an office it was a symbol of inclusivity nehru's actions spoke louder than words shaping the very fabric of secular india now let's unravel the tale of nehru's economic vision a journey filled with ambition industrialization and well a few hiccups along the way here's where the action hits up 
under Nehru's watch, India's industrialization took off. Vilay Steel Plant, a marvel born in 1959 with Soviet assistance, aimed to make India self-reliant in steel production, ambitious to say the least. And it doesn't stop there. Nehru, the architect of institutions like the Indian Institutes of Technology and Indian Council of Agricultural Research, capital development and agricultural productivity were on the agenda. Nehru wasn't just talking, he was building the foundation. The Planning Commission was established in 1950. Nehru, the visionary, believed in the power of rapid industrialization to tackle mass poverty, a decisive move that shaped India's five-year plans. In Nehru's economic strategy, there were no subsidies, no entitlements. The focus was on increasing savings, creating resources for asset creation. But hold on, there set with deep suspicion of foreign trade and emphasis on import substitution, a strategy that had its critics. The Mumbai economists sounded the alarm. Focus on wage goods, they said. Food and textiles needed attention, they said. Did Nehru eat the warning? Not quite. The economic strategy initially successful faced challenges later on. As time marched on, Nehru's economic model showed signs of fatigue. An inefficient industrial structure, government regulation overload, global market competition struggles, unintended consequences of a model that once held promise. Nehru's hopes for an enlightened bureaucracy. Well, let's just say it didn't quite pan out as planned. The license permit Raj became a breeding ground for corruption. Not the beacon of efficiency and mission. Nehru's economic thinking had a touch of Marxism tailored for Indian conditions. Yet, despite the highs, the lows and the unexpected turns, his model faced scrutiny. Picture this, the mid-1960s, India faces not one but two consecutive bad harvests. A perfect storm that triggers a balance of payments problem leading to the inevitable devaluation of the rupee and a desperate plea for support from the Bretton Woods institution. Hold on, it gets trickier. Indian industries once on a promising trajectory find themselves in the doldrum, stuck in a stagnant phase for a whooping 15 years. Now let's talk about the grand plans to tackle asset inequality and curb industrial monopoly. Despite novel intentions, the evidence neatly packaged in the reports by the likes of P.C. Mahalanobis and K.C. Dasgupta suggests a not-so-happy ending to those end years. But yes, the kicker, it wasn't the strategy's fault. The failures were more about the missing pieces of the puzzle. The prerequisites needed to sprinkle a bit of magic on the grand plan. According to some, Nehru's focus on heavy capital-intensive industry at a time of capital scarcity had unintended, had unintended consequences. Slow transitions, suboptimal scales and a struggle to bring prosperity to all. In the end, Nehru's economic legacy is a complex tale filled with ambition, successes and the inevitable challenges that come with charting a new course for a nation. Now let's dive into the fascinating world of Nehru's vision for science, a realm where imagination met the quest for a robust and self-reliant India. You see, to truly appreciate Nehru's stance on science, we need to step back and examine the India he inherited. A nation shackled by 200 years of exploitation and colonization. Bhagat Singh, the firebrand revolutionary, saw Nehru not as a mere reformer, but as a radical force for change. In Nehru's eyes, science wasn't just about industry and development. It was a canvas where he painted a picture of a transformed India. Fast forward to 1948. And we find Nehru setting the stage for scientific progress by establishing the Atomic Energy Commission. His commitment to expanding research in atomic physics was unwavering. Then came a pivotal moment in 1954, the creation of the Atomic Energy Establishment in Trombay, later renamed the Baba Atomic Research Center in 1967, in honor of the visionary scientist Omi Baba, who met a tragic end. In the grand tapestry of Nehru's legacy, his commitment to science stands out as a beacon of progress, a testament to his dream of a nation shaped by the principles of rationality and innovation. Now let's dive into the diplomatic dance of Nehru during the Cold War, a time when the world was split between the United States and the Soviet Union. Nehru, the visionary, led the charge with the non-aligned movement, juggling relations like a seasoned diplomat. Picture this, the 1956 Hungarian crisis puts Nehru in a tight spot. Soft line, hard choices, with a serious crisis demanding attention too, Nehru walks a diplomatic tightrope, trading carefully due to India's need for Soviet support in Kashmir. But hold on, non-alignment wasn't a rigid doctrine for Nehru. 
He was a pragmatic leader, navigating the complexities of global politics with a keen eye. Yet, in October 1956, India stands on the Hungarian Revolution raised eyebrows. Non-communist members started scrutinizing Nehru's non-alignment policy. The political spotlight can be ours. Now let's stop Goa. The military occupation in 1961 sparked global outrage, but history's insight justifies Nehru's actions. Six years of diplomacy, appeals, and a non-violent demonstration met with Portuguese bullets. When India struck, Nehru stood by the pragmatism of real politics. Despite the 1962 China-India war, Nehru's foreign policy was a success, safeguarding India's interests and contributing to decolonization. He remained the people's idol from 1929 to 1964, weathering political storms. Renata credits Nehru for rejecting revivalism, championing secular and modern democratic values. But Godbole notes Nehru's failures were self-inflicted excessive civilities, team building challenges and an air of superiority. So as we reflect on Nehru's legacy, let's objectively consider the eyes, acknowledge the lows and recognize the era that played a role in shaping the destiny of a nation. Thank you. If you like this video please like share and subscribe for more such contents